you guys to our New Media Visionaries lecture series. If this is your first time, thanks for coming. And I see a lot of new faces here, so uh, thanks for joining us. And if you've been here before, thanks for coming back. Uh, we have a great lecture here today for you, but some business to take care of first. All of our lectures, uh, their content can be accessed online either uh, during the lecture or after at uh, newmediavisionaries.org. And you can also get the lectures streamed live uh, on ustream.com slash newmediavisionaries dot TV. Thank you. Um, and we'll also have it on YouTube afterward if you guys want to watch it. Our guest lecturer today is a San Jose State graduate. He received an MBA in sustainable management, business, leadership, and entrepreneurship at Presidio Graduate School. For the past five years, he has been an industrial interaction and experience designer for Elemental 8, just located in downtown San Jose. He also works in user experience design, user needs analysis, market research, and branding. At Elemental 8, he engaged in 30-plus medical and consumer projects. Please help me welcome Mr. Alan Enamark. Awesome. Uh, welcome, guys. Glad to be here. And um, glad to kind of share my kind of passion for design with you guys and uh, talk about how it applies to new media. Um, so as uh, you've been introduced, uh, I'm a designer. Uh, I do all kinds of design, and I do it at this place, which is just down the street, really. Uh, it's a little design consultancy uh, called Elemental 8, and I've been there for about five years, uh, doing all kinds of things such as this thing. Um, it's a projector, a digital projector using lasers. It does 3D. It's really high-end and expensive. Um, but basically figuring out, OK, how does the uh, company branding tied into the physical appearance of the model, and as well as, OK, how do we make it manufacturable, man manufacturable and that kind of such details. But I've um, been also doing such things as um, web design, uh, figuring out, OK, what exactly um, is our client needing to present on the web? You know, are they uh, just doing something that's informative? Are they trying to sell things? Um, how does that tie into their branding? Uh, so this was an interesting project because we basically got to run the gamut with them. They came to us with, OK, I have no branding. I have, all I have is just some uh, things that I, I can basically manufacture and sell. And so we kind of worked with the branding language, interacted or integrated it with um, basically the website and also some of the products. And so creating this kind of coherent message um, was the fun part of this project. So um, that's a little bit of my background. But what I came here to talk about is really um, design in general um, and how design thinking is this powerful tool that I've learned um, with my design background as kind of a way of approaching these complex and hairy problems, uh, for instance, new media. Um, so basically, you know, what, how we can take design thinking, and it's not just something for designers, it's something everybody can use as a way of um, basically tackling uh, these challenges. But uh, first off, I just want to say, you know, I'm not going to be monologuing here uh, just by myself. Ask questions, raise your hand. Um, you know, you know. If you're curious, let me know. Talk to me. Uh, I, you know, I'll answer your questions. We'll, I'll try to make this as interactive as possible, because um, I just don't want to hear myself speak the whole time. Uh, you know, small class size, I guess. So might as well take advantage of that. So first off, you know, before you can start going into what is design thinking and how does it apply to new media, um, what is design? Okay, everybody probably has an idea of what, what design is. Um, for some reason, this wonderful picture isn't showing up. One second. OK. Nope. OK. Well, all right, you can figure out how or what is design. What do you think about it? when you pull out of your pocket, and how many of you guys here have iPhones, you know, iPads? Yeah, there you go. Everybody knows what they have. So when you think of design, you think of iPhone, shiny, you know, nice 
desirable object, right? Um, you also think of things like, oh, man, this is annoying. Let me try to figure out why this is not working. Oh, well. Wing it. So you also think of, say, graphic design. Um, a lot of you are in journalism, maybe have a little bit more experience with that. You think of, you know, giant posters and print and these, like, innovative journalism, like, spreads for magazines and things like that. Um, you know, very cutting edge. You also think of things like um, architecture. Uh, you know, this, you, you think of designer building, right? You think of this thing, big open spaces, cutting edge, very like expensive looking, uh, you know, I wish you could have that, it's never going to happen sort of deal. Um, or you think of, you know, very stern looking guy with like designer looking glasses and turtleneck and that whole deal, right? He's um, one of the famous designers at Pentagram and he does a lot of branding stuff too. And you think of him doing that stuff in this, you know, sleek and very minimal and uh, well thought out of design studio space like wow this is this is impressive like you know I don't want to actually sully it with actually being there I just want to like look at it and admire it you know fantastic um, but design is uh, it's not just those little thing, uh, areas it's actually all kinds of stuff because you think about it design is anything that basically humankind has created because it has to have some sort of designer behind that. I mean, you look at the, these chairs here and like they might not be the most comfortable thing in the world, but somebody actually had to sit down and decide, okay, what kind of curve is going to be here? You know, what kind of materials is going to be? Well, if you look at the siding, there's some nice little decorative elements and that has to be designed. You look at all the things like this building and, you know, the wall that you have in your pocket and everything is actually designed. And this is all part of this landscape of what people call design. Um, you have things like graphic design, you have things like packaging design, which is its own little uh, development in itself, which is, okay, you th how do, you know, the packaging folds, uh, how do you make it interesting? You have things like furniture design, you have industrial design, which is my background, uh, which is more of like products, um, and it can be anything from, I mean, I've known industrial designers who actually are the guys who try to figure out cereal and how to make it like extra crunchy, you know. That's like design in itself. Um, there's really neat stuff in service design, uh, which is a little bit more abstract, but when you think of a lot of uh, development nowadays is in areas where it's not just as product, right, but is like, if you think of a product as a means of delivering a service, um, that kind of starts opening up your mind to, well, okay, what else can it do? For instance, um, think of something like Uber, Uber Cab. It's uh, it's actually a product and a service in itself because you have an app. And what it is is you basically can, you know, hit a button and a taxi cab type thing will show up at your doorstep right away and you know how long it'll take and you can pay for it all through your phone, which is fantastic. But um, somebody has to kind of envision that, okay, this is all part of this kind of ecosystem I'm trying to create as this service. So basically, uh, what I'm making a point here is design isn't like, you know, these the standardized sort of Oh, it's this guy in his clean studio, and you know he's very stoic, and uh, it's only these, these major fields that people know. Design is everywhere. It's prolific, um, and it's fantastic. Uh, but then the question is, okay, so great. Where's the thinking part, right? What does thinking have to do with design? Um, and the big distinction I want to make is, you know, again, all these things I've mentioned is you, you think of it as this design, this iPhone. It's this finalized product. It's like the period, you know. It is done. Uh, I don't touch it. It is this eternal sort of thing. Um, but really, the powerful part of design is the process behind it. All the stuff that happens before this product. You know, all the stuff that uh, basically comes into, all right, what am I going to make? How am I going to make it? For who? Um, basically, that's the key part of design. So, um, what I have is kind of put together this list of little kind of indicators and features of design that I think are important. It's definitely not comprehensive, but it gives you a better picture than, okay, just this product or this thing that I can hold. Um, it's actually the 
the ideas and mentality behind design. That's the real powerhouse for it. So really, design is not a finalized thing. It is an act. It's a behavior. It's doing. Um, as you can see here, somebody's mocking it up. So you don't just say, you don't have this white piece of paper and then a ruler and you draw something and I'm done, okay? It's like, it's the act of, okay, thinking through how does this thing work, how, how, you know, how it's going to interact with people. Um, and the best way to figure that stuff out is to not just sit at a desk, it's to actually go out and do it, to mock it up, to, to interact with people, to talk, to, to do a run research and figure it out. So design is this doing process, this, act, this activity. Um, and because of this activity, it's messy. It has nothing to do with that clean, pristine looking studio that uh, is kind of like the stereotypical design house. Um, that's only when the photographer shows up. Usually it looks like this, which is actually um, the art building and the industrial design studio, like basically during finals. It is a mess. Um, and how it it's cleaned up, I don't know, at the end of every semester, but you can tell people are getting busy. They're doing. They're they're you know sending down models. They're figuring stuff out. They're figuring out how forms working. They're making up all these mock-ups. There, it's an activity. Um, and on top of that, it's collaboration. Uh, design isn't just this one guy figuring out by himself. Um, it's this group of people working together because really, design's trying to take on these really really complex issues. It's uh, these, these things that like, okay, you can't just send some guy out to figure it out. It's like, okay, well, I have to go this cross-disciplinary um, experience that I need to basically get all these different perspectives and find a way of putting them together. And that's what design is really good at doing. It's uh, basically creating this framework through design thinking process where you can grab somebody who has an experience in something like, you know, graphic design. You can grab somebody who has something to, uh, experience in like product design see, okay, well, what kind of insights can we get by working these two people together? You can get somebody for like a psychologist come together and say, okay, well, you know, we're making this product, what kind of, um, you know, emotional reaction will it have, you know, and what kind of emotional reaction do we want it to have? Um, you can get all kinds of, you can get some material engineer guy who says, hey, I have this, this great new material that, you know, can stretch 300 times its, its you know, normal size, what can we do with it? Um, and it's basically messily coming together and to kind of figure out the best way to solve problems, really. Um, and probably the most powerful thing about design, design thinking, because, um, okay, you can solve problems, but why are you going to solve problems? Like, for who are you solving the problem? Uh, that's this crucial differentiation that so many businesses and companies and stuff mix. They, they come, like that guy with that really great material idea comes out and says, hey, let's, you know, make a chair that stretches 200% of its size because we have this neat material and they just throw it out there and they put all this effort into making it. But then like everybody says, well, no, I don't need that chair that does that. Why would I even, you know, and then it flops. And then they're like, wasted all this energy on it. So the idea is instead of saying, what can we do is more like, why should we? and for who, specifically for who. And that's a big one that I'll come back later. It's all about, okay, how am I addressing a person's problems, you know, their needs? The, the big one is their latent desires and needs. And so it's not something that a lot of people can actually express. It's something, here's a good example. Um, you know, everybody thinks of good design, they know what it is, but good indicator of bad design is something that really bugs you. So, for instance, alarm clocks. Um, does anybody still have alarm clocks, actually? Okay, well, you still use the alarm clock. What is something that really bugs you about the alarm clock, aside from the fact that, well, maybe not even, but what bugs you about the alarm clock? Something just off the top of your head. There you go. So, Somebody somewhere decide, okay, I'm designing this alarm clock, I'm going to make this PC board, and I'm going to get this off-the-shelf whatever buzzer because it's cheap and I know the guy who can make it. So they put that together. And I guess it gets the job done. But, okay, they're not exactly 
addressing your specific needs is this obnoxious buzzer, which is like, okay, well, nobody wants to be waking up this horrible way. You know, they're not, you, why do you want to start your day like that? I mean, that's just going to set this whole chain reaction of things that's going to be like, ah, oh, I'm woken up, it's not. It's, so instead, why don't you use like, well, what are some pleasant sounding things that you like, for instance? Music. Okay, what type of music? Um, I, I, 90s, rock. 90s rock, fantastic. So now, that is like an explicit sort of need and desire, but then what a good design does or a designer and a design team does is like, okay, she's expressed this need to wake up in the morning. She's expressed that, oh, I don't like this a noisy buzzer. And I knew I like things that, well, maybe music, for instance. And so what we can, you don't take that quite literally say, okay, now we'll just play music. We'll say, okay, maybe, you know, this is all the top of my head, is it's something to do with like the type of rhythm that the soft jazz has, where it's just like this easygoing pace, and that's kind of a nice way to start your day. Maybe something that, you know, starts going faster and faster as you start like having to wake up more. And it becomes more like the subconscious way of transitioning from, the sleep state into the wake state, you know? How are different ways we can do that? That's where the design thinking process comes in, saying, okay, that's one way. It's like there's this unmet need of kind of not just need to wake up at a specific time, but where we step back and say, we're trying to transition this person from sleep into wakefulness in the most peaceful and energizing way possible. And all of a sudden, that opens up all these other possibilities that are not just like, okay, buzzer sound, you know? Um, that's the kind of the power of focusing on the user and their wants and needs. Um, and it's very powerful, but yet somehow it's still something that a lot of companies and a lot of people need to kind of get aware of, which is why I love giving this speech. Um, so another important thing about design and design thinking uh, is future forward. All right, So that means it's not something that it already is. Uh, and this is tricky because this inherently means there's a lot of subjectivity and a little bit of ambiguity and uncertainty. And, um, you know, it's a bit mushy. And, like, a lot of people don't like that because that makes them kind of uncomfortable because there's not this quantifiable things. Because what design needs to do is basically imagine what should be and what could be, not what already is. And that's why, again, you take latent user needs. It's, um, you know, it's not like what this person says they need, but you have to kind of project, okay, they're saying this and this and this, but what they really want is this. And it's not something they have. Because, I mean, the whole point of design is planning, right? It's, it's creating something that isn't in existence yet, and you have to kind of convey that. And so what you need to do is, look forward as, okay, what could possibly be? And so that's the tricky part about design and design thinking. And so that's why you want to have all this kind of diverse perspectives to kind of fill it out as nicely as possible. And so, of course, that, that makes it ambiguous. Now, I don't want to say that design is ambiguous because that would be a bad thing. That would be you're not communicating it well, you haven't thought it out well. It's design thinking is um, a way of handling ambiguity and uncertainty. It's a way of saying that I'm comfortable because another important feature about design and design thinking is, uh, you know, it's not like an A to B. It's like, here's my problem, this is my solution, straight line, okay? It's saying, well, all right, this is my problem, I'm filling it out, I'm defining it, I'm researching, um, you know, all the things I need to know about and potentially could use, and then I don't know exactly where I'm going with this yet. Uh, and that is uncomfortable because of that uncertainty. It's like, you know, you go to, a, imagine you're going to like your manager and he's saying like, okay, I given this, all this money for this budget and give me all this to people to help me research these things out. And he's like, what are you going to do with it? And you're like, well, I don't know yet. You know, it's like, uh, no. Um, and that's something like as design consultancies you have to do all the time. And so that's why it's really important to have kind of the design process to fall back on and kind of rely on because you say, it feels uncomfortable, you know, I'm not sure exactly where it's going to go. I know kind of the direction, and the more I research, I'll figure it out, but um, I can't point to a, a 
a finalized thing that will be manifested out of this research just yet. And so that's why you have to rely on the process to say that, okay, I know it's happened before, and I know good things happen historically, but I want to follow this process, so it's okay. You know, it's okay to have the ambiguity here. Yeah, exactly. It's it really, and um, that's actually one of the quotes I was going to use. Is more of it's not so much the destination, it's that journey, and that's a big thing when I was being taught in school. Is okay, you know, we come up with this great concept and we're like do the renderings and like present it to a teacher. And I'm like, yeah, that's nice, it's a good idea, but like, document. How did you did you document how you got there? And we're like, no, I, this, why does it matter? This is a good idea. This is the thing they pounded into our head so many times. It's like it doesn't matter. It has to be reproducible. Right, and that's the the another big thing about design is it has to be reproducible, scalable. It has to be something that you can consistently do and prove to others that you consistently do. Um, that leads into something like communication, and a whole thing about design is really because it's this future forward, this this kind of ambiguity stuff. It's really important to kind of communicate with um, not just with other members of your team, but with your clients, with um, with kind of potential customers and users, you know, you need to be able to kind of explain what the innate abilities of this thing are and uh, how it should be used. So, coming back to the journey thing, therefore you need process, okay? Um, and this is probably the most important thing about design and design thinking um, is relying on the process. Like I said, you can have a you know one hit wonder, you come up with this great idea. Uh, super, but like your job is to be perpetually creative. Um, and so there are all kinds of sort of mock ups and diagrams of what design process and thinking stuff is, right? Um, this is one of the more common ones. This is one's a little bit more for, um, you know, visual design stuff. Uh, it's called like the, the funnel method, right? So what you do is you start off with um, sketch which is kind of this rough idea, like you're kind of generally defining, you're researching, you're figuring out every you can about a project and its problems, and then you're essentially narrowing it down a little bit, like, okay, well, can I get some concepts? Can I get some, you know, concrete ideas out of this? Okay, it, you know, you start narrowing it down a little bit. You kind of, through experience and through talking to other people, and you kind of, okay, vetting which one's out, you do a little bit of validating. Okay, so these three concepts are really good. And then you basically mock it up, you do a little more testing, and eventually you come down to like this functional prototype, this one kind of, this is the thing that panned out. Based on um, all the good ideas and all the meshing of different viewpoints, it's kind of funneled out to this one thing. Um, which is fine and dandy because it's a good way of kind of narrowing kind of the, the focus of the work, you know, instead of broad focus and then a little bit more, you know, focused into specific ideas and then one focus for a final idea. Um, it's nice and dandy, but it doesn't convey quite the whole picture. And this is another kind of uh, chart with the design process, where you identify the problem, you brainstorm. Um, brainstorm is really important because this is where you, you don't rely on one person. Again, it's a collaboration where you try to get as broad uh, viewpoints as possible. Because it's kind of like idea sex. You know, you like throwing this idea, you throw this one idea, and somehow maybe they mesh together in a neat way and produce this novel thing. And they're like, hey, that's cool. We didn't think of that before. Um, and then you keep doing that, you keep designing. So this is different because it doesn't show us this linear process. It's kind of like one of those other design stereotypes or like conventions where design is this like linear process. It's like goes straight forward, it marches on, um, it's very consistent. This starts showing that eh, maybe that's not quite the case. I mean, usually when you're a design consultant, you kind of promote that image to the clients is like, don't worry, everything's going according to plan, we're at this step, this step is next, you know, it's part of that whole budgeting thing. Um, but meanwhile, on the back end, is like, okay, well, you always have to validate, you know, it's like, okay, I have this idea, and does it actually work? So then you go to the users, you know, you do some user testing, you go to some focus groups, you actually pr create a mock-up and present it in front of them, and, you know, they might hold it upside down, and you're like, no, you're doing it wrong. No, it means that your design isn't accurately communicating how it's supposed to be used. You have to go back, revalidate it, figure it out again, and say, or maybe that comes up with a whole new insight where, hey, this is neat. Um, we didn't think we can use it upside down. 
It actually works better that way. And so you then reconfigure. And so you, it's a cyclical thing where you redesign, rebuild, test, evaluate. Eventually, you, you kind of whittle it down to like, this thing's working pretty good. We can do something with it. Um, so actually, this is one of my favorite diagrams because it's probably the most accurate. Um, it's like design process. Ah, you're pulling your hair out and something didn't work. Or it, it's one of the reasons I like design so much is because it's kind of you get this high. You, you get this digging into this meaty problem. It's really complicated. You have to figure out all this new stuff that you've never learned before. Um, like for instance, like medical design, we had this project where we're doing uh, oncology, which is cancer treatment. And then we're doing a specific one that has to do with protons using as a way of cancer treatment. And it's like, okay, so now I'm starting to look into like nuclear physics and figuring out how this all works. And you're not exactly sure why I need to know nuclear physics, but you need to know that maybe this is interesting. I could use it for a little bit of the style of the language, you know. So then you start conveying things like beams and like giant magnets and, you know, stuff like that. You're like, okay, so maybe I can convey a little bit of, because um, a lot about design is, you know, basically, as a designer, is your job to minimize things, to decomplicate it, to make it understandable and intuitive. Because um, there's a complicated world. So it's like the same thing when you have an iPhone, like, you know, the technical capability of this thing, which is, like, literally giving you access to, like, all of human knowledge and experience, like, pretty much anywhere. Um, you know, that's all contained with a little icon that says Internet, you know? Uh, and so, like, oh, of course, I'll just click on that button. But, like, there's so much that goes behind that, and that's what this Suya line kind of signifies is the designers pulling their hair out and trying to make it understandable and, like, going back and revalidating it, and then, okay, here. And then when you get that little insight where if I put these two pieces together and then throw in a little bit of this and put it in front of a user and then it works and they get it, like, hey, that's fantastic. This is great. Uh, it's, it's very satisfying. So, there's a lot of different ways you can do that. Um, so, it's, you know, the design process is kind of that big thing I've been explaining to you, which is the, the, the framework, the, the kind of way of channeling forward. Um, and there's a lot of different tools that can specifically uh, be used to help that process along. Um, this is by no means comprehensive. Uh, IDO, I'm sure you guys have heard of them, big design consultancy, they're kind of famous. They have like 52 specific little tool things that they can pull out at any moment and kind of be used as a way of um, help, you know, progressing that design process. And so there are things like focus groups, um, which is, you know, you basically start asking people what their problems are and trying to get a little bit of insight on what their latent desires and needs are. And you have things like 3D rendering where if you use a computer and you build a model in 3D and you make it look all pretty and shiny and, like, use that as a way of communicating what this potential thing can be without actually having to make it. Um, you know, that's all part of prototyping, mind mapping, sketching. So there's all these different ways of, you know, A-B testing is a big one for, like, kind of the virtual space. It's what Google does all the time. Um, you may not know about it, but, you know, Google has these millions of users, right? And what they'll do is they'll, you'll click on their search page, and they might have a button that is, you know, placed on the left side for 10,000 users. And then they might have the button that's placed on the right side for another 10,000 users. And, like, nobody knows they're part of this. And then based on some basic algorithms of how many people click on the button on the left side versus on the right side, they basically calculate, oh, that's a better position for the button. Um, and then they use that to implement it out through everybody else. And so that's A-B testing. It's like these two different variations, and depending on how many people click on it, that's a measure. And so that's kind of like a slightly different approach that Google uses to the design process. Um, they're trying to make it a lot more quantifiable. Um, so they can, they're a lot more engineering-based. Um, and so they use that tool as a more um, qualified way of saying this is a better design, this is the design direction we need to go in, versus a place like Apple, um, they don't really do that much with focus groups and testing because, um, again, just by the company culture, and they've, they have some really good designers who can, just based on their experience, say, the button on the right side is probably a better way to go just because it meshes either A with their kind of design language and philosophy or just their experience that, you know, people tend to click on these types of buttons better just from their experience. And so it's just a different approach. I mean, there's a big debate which is better, which is not. 
Um, you know, I'm saying whatever works, go for it. Uh, diversity is better. Yes? Well, that sort of points to the difference between the way Apple designs things and Microsoft, probably. I think Microsoft yeah. has a lot more collaboration, a lot more focus groups, and it ends up being a lot heavier. Than yeah, and that's um, over-engineered or just diluted in a way. Um, that's a, a kind of an interesting thing that happens where, I mean, I don't want to unbag on specific cars, but you look at something like the Toyota Corolla, okay? That is something that Toyota says, we want to appeal to as wide a group as possible, all right? And so then it's kind of like, I mean, I want to use this weird metaphor, but you know when like a solar system is forming and then all of a sudden basically you just have this gaseous cloud and just by all the little particles bumming into each other, it kind of forms the planets. And so like it's this averaging of everything to form this kind of generic looking thing. That's exactly where like the Toyota Corolla is really. It's like this kind of averaged device that like is not going to really entice anybody. They're like, wow, it's a Toyota Corolla. I'm super stoked about this thing. Everybody will be like basically satisfied by it, you know? Versus Apple will be like, and again, this is a different approach. As the designers, they'll be like, we're going to make this aspirational thing, you know? And it's going to be this awesome car that is intuitive enough that anybody can basically use it, but then it's going to be desirable because we, you know, we don't dilute it with all these, like, beigeness and things that aren't in front. Because, like, it's interesting. And then all of a sudden, you notice the difference because it's this aspirational, <laughs> aspirational thing is people change their opinion about what is good. You know, they kind of change the entire perspective of, well, if all my friends are saying this is cool, then I guess this is cool. And it's sort of this critical mass where all of a sudden that becomes this neat thing to want. And that's where you start meshing kind of a little bit of the branding and marketing with the design side. And you kind of, when you put those together really well, you can get some really powerful things like Apple and you know, Apple fanboys, right? You know. Um, I mean, I'm using a Mac, but I'm a little bit agnostic about it because I, I know some of their tricks. Um, but you can see the difference between something like Microsoft, where they're actually they're technically a much bigger company as an overhead-wise, and they do really good things, especially like with um, Windows 8 and all that kind of interfacing. Uh, I definitely appreciate it because they're like, we're going to try something else than what Apple's doing and just copy them. Um, but that means they have to go up at a little bit more risk, you know. They have to kind of go against all that sort of network effect that Apple's kind of put out there. And so it's, I don't know, it's something you consistently have to kind of reevaluate. It's funny to hear you describe it that way because Apple's built their reputation on being way out there in front, on the bleeding edge, trend setting rather than. That's the image. Yeah, and that, that's and that's exactly it. By basically becoming this aspirational thing, and then everybody joins it, like everybody. So it's and it's this is a tricky part that Apple has kind of have to navigate through. I mean, it's a little bit of a, a side note, but it's like they have to kind of still project this like trend setting and like oh, I'm unique vibe when like everybody's still doing it. Um, so it's almost like, and they're still like the underdogs, because Apple's always been like the underdog. Like, okay, we're nimble, we can change, we can try these risky things. But really, Apple's never been, I mean, I don't want to say dare, like innovative in that sense, like they'll try something completely crazy and new. They'll see somebody who's done something and say, this has something to it, we'll just do it better, we'll refine it, we'll, we'll make it work much better than anybody else has been able to do before. Um, and that's kind of how they, they push it, based on the kind of their guts and knowing Okay, our experience. Um, but, like, again, it's this very focused vision versus this kind of distributed average, like averaging of, you know, ideas. Um, so, like you say, you know, again, to kind of go back to what I was mentioning before, like, you think of design as this linear process and, like, there's this expert and there's this clean, you know, very straightforward thing. And no, there's all this back end that goes. There's a million different ways to approach it. And that's, again, why the process is so is important and why kind of having that design thinking mentality is important because you're okay with the ambiguity. You're okay with, okay, well, it's going to be a little bit fuzzy. We, we kind of don't have exactly an answer, but we know it's good enough to do something that somebody will like. Um, so just 
kind of a personal story um, about design thinking and how it's not just necessarily the realm of designers and these you know experts. Uh, the process is really robust in the sense that um, so IDEO has this kind of workshops where they kind of promote the you know design thinking stuff and. Uh, for my grad school, what I actually went to was, I went to Thailand and um, did a little bit of workshop there for, okay, what's design thinking? And so it's a, like, you know, a three hour, four hour thing where you kind of convey the idea of, instead of saying, here's a problem, there's a solution A to B, you say, okay, I'm going to do um, kind of the design thinking, design process approach. Uh, and this one, in this case, it's make a wallet. You know, very simple, right? Everybody knows what a wallet is. Make a better wallet. Um, and so they're given a blank piece of paper and say, make a wallet. And like, everybody does a horrible job because like, well, I don't know, let's, what do I do? Instead, okay, well, you step back and say, well, make a wallet for this specific person, you know, and work with the person next to you and say, hey, do you have some ideas to make better ones? And then all these, this is where another tool is basically the idea board with post-its. Everybody has all these different ideas and really quickly jots them down visually. And so this is an amazing thing is, these guys, they're not like designers. There's this language barrier, and this is something we're giving them tasks in three hours, which is, you know, what a lot of professionals do for their entire life. Um, and by the end of it, they've came up with really amazing ideas for Watts. Um, you know, there's like simple things like, you know, having um, sort of like a stylish chain stuff or ways of, um, I forget specifics, but there's like something really specific to like Thai culture, um, which is amazing because it's like, these guys had no design experience at the beginning, but then just by following this sort of process and working through a little bit of, granted, um, what makes it work is it's guided, you know, because if you just let these people go loose, um, and that's the thing where a formal design training is important is because you go through the process a lot of times, you get a lot of experience, and so that makes you be able to, I've done this before, I know where there's per like roadblocks, I know that I can get stuck on this, and that's why, um, you know, a lot of big design consultancies and companies um, kind of, it's not so much that they're selling something completely different, because like, they all say we have these very different design processes, but they're all the same. It's a little bit of a secret, you know. All design consultancies basically do the same thing. Um, the thing that they're bringing to the table that's different is the kind of the individualized experience with who's working there and a little bit of the legacy of them um, that that brings. And so, you know, you can come up with really good ideas, uh, even if you're not a designer, is the end point of saying, you know, following that process. So, yeah, design thinking, anybody can do it with a little bit of help and guidance. So, that's kind of like the quick summarization of design and design thinking. Um, but what does that have to do with new media? Um, which is kind of why we're here today, specifically. And, uh, well, so we're kind of in this unique environment now. Uh, we have the intersection of the World Wide Web, cyberspace, if anybody remembers those terms, wireless, and mobile. And so also now, you, like you said, you have this iPhone, you have your iPads, you have access to the internet from anywhere um, to access almost anything. And so all of a sudden it's like, well, why would I need a newspaper? Or why do I need a magazine now, you know? Um, or why do we even need TV? You know, that's a big thing that's happening. Uh, so it's this, all of a sudden, it's like the technology has kind of created this new playground, this new sandbox. And again, because it's new, nobody really knows quite how to deal with it yet. And again, it's like, if you start noticing, this is, if you guys remember the Space Jam movie that happened in the late 90s, uh, I recently found out this is the website that they made for the movie, and it's still online at Warner Brothers. Like, they just forgot about it. And if you look at it, it's pretty awful. Um, so I put it up here because it shows just how far we've come in, like, a decade, you know? Or even just imagine what the Internet was like 2004 and then what it is now. It's matured a lot. And so it's basically, it's going to start taking off crazy because, you know, before you have to type in these like numbers and like you know IRC, it just wasn't very user friendly. But now, because of things like the iPhone and flash interfaces, anybody can use it and it's easy to use and it's enjoyable to use. Um, so, 
This is kind of uh, this is actually a Business Insider uh, State of the Internet in 2012. I recommend you guys look it up. It's mind blowing. Um, they put some good numbers behind this. This is just one example of old media versus new media. Just how much money is being pumped into this stuff, um, including Apple, which is basically they're creating this whole infrastructure for a lot of it. You notice these companies, they're basically the trendsetters, and they're pushing it. And so it's pretty clear where the industry is going um, and the fact that it's getting bigger. You start looking at this big information, personal computers, like we were having a discussion earlier, it's like, you know, you get your iPhone or you get your smart device. Do you really need your desktop anymore? No, not really. I mean, unless you're doing some really heavy-duty rendering or something, I can just check my email. I can get my Facebook. And so, smartphone sales overtook PC sales. So, new media. It's no longer going to be like on your TV. You're not, you have this little display with you at all times. What can you do with that? Um, new media is personalized. Like this thing, um, not many people probably would want that, but somebody did apparently. Uh, so it's personalized because it can be, and it's easy to, easy to be personalized. So like imagine, it's like a newspaper that they can just print one of just for you. Like, wow, what are the opportunities of that? That's fantastic. Um, that means it's interactive. It's like, it's not just this thing where it's just, okay, lights hitting off and just bouncing off my eyeballs, and that's that. It's like, I can change the content, I can dive into the content more. It's like when you go on a Wikipedia binge, like you get some link to one article, and you click, 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 and all of a sudden you're... You know, you've known all this new stuff that you didn't know before, and you spent three hours in like you know middle of the night and learning about I don't know wombats randomly. Uh, but that's kind of like this. <laughs> I wouldn't know. I look that. I can Wikipedia that and find out. I mean, that's amazing. It, so it's interactive. Um, but another thing is it's fragmented. Um, and this is kind of an important thing about that is, well, you look at a long time ago, long, depending on who you're talking to, you had like, you know, the four networks, right? And you had the news hour, and that was like, that was your information source, you know? You had the radio broadcast. And then you started getting cable, and things started getting a little bit more concentrated. And so now, basically, it's very fragmented because, A, it's, you know, customizable and personable, that I can now basically tailor exactly what type of information I get. And that's like Google, for a long time there's this big kind of debate about Google searches. Um, Google didn't know how its algorithm was really doing it, but basically the person, you could type in a Google search about like, I don't know, the BP oil spill. And then the person next to you could type in about the BP oil spill. And they'll get, you know, totally different results. One would be more about like liberal things like, uh, you know, people going in and saying how all the animals are dying. Another person would get something that's like basically the BP PR guys or their stock quotes, you know. And what used to be something that was, you know, you have somebody who basically consolidate the information for you and tell you in a more or less unbiased way that this is the information you should know. Now, if you want it or not, it's getting completely personalized to your individual things. And so that's creating these little isolated bubbles where you don't actually get information that you don't want, and so you might not be exposed to different viewpoints. So that is an issue in itself, this fragmentation of, you know, everybody who listens to Bill O'Reilly can only go listen to Bill O'Reilly, and everybody who listens to John Stewart can only go listen to John Stewart. Um, but at the same time, uh, the other perspective is that creates a kind of very strong communities. Because instead of okay, everybody's with everybody, it's like, well, I'm with these people that I can relate to, and I can start forming these interesting communities based around similar viewpoints and interests. So it's kind of two sides of the coin, but it's definitely something you need to take in consideration with this new media. Um, another very important thing, it's two-way. Uh, you have, of course, the Twitter bird right here. Uh, it used to be that, how would I contact a company, or how do I interact with it? You call a customer support, and it's like, so what? if they listen to you. Um, but now, because you have this broadcast media that literally everybody is, there's this guy, for instance, Delta, he was, he was a musician, and he looks out this window and he sees them like throwing his guitar and breaking it, and usually, like when they're blowing it into an airplane, and usually it would be like, sorry, tough luck, whatever, we don't care, we're Delta. Um, he made like a catchy little video on it, put it on YouTube, it went viral, 
And everybody's like, man, Delta, Delta, they're just jerks. Why, you know, why should we even fly? And all of a sudden, like Delta's getting scared, like this one little bad little blurb is getting, you know, three million page views on YouTube, and they're losing. So they like, oh, here's some free tickets. We're so sorry. Um, so it becomes this two-way interaction between what used to be this people who would broadcast it out to you one way, and now the individual can broadcast out on the same par as like these giant companies, which is really fantastic and new and kind of scary to a lot of people. Um, that's something that people are still trying to get a hold of. Uh, also, it's, again, anywhere, right? You know, it, it, what used to be, I'm sitting in front of my living room and a couch, and everybody knows that context, right? It's now, am I in a BART train? Am I, you know, in the airplane flying now with wireless internet in the airplane? Am I, you know, uh, walking down the street and not looking in the street and getting hit by a car? Like, you know, what is the context, right? It basically can be anywhere, uh, which is something that is new to media consumption. Um, and it's any time, um, also known as now. Uh, like, you know, it, it's, it's funny how quickly there's like a Lucy K skit about how quickly people get dissatisfied with things. Um, like he won this whole skit where like, you know, the, he's there in an airplane and somebody announces that this airplane now has, you know, wireless internet on it. Like, have fun with it. And people are like, yay, wireless internet. And like within five seconds, people are already complaining, oh, this internet's so slow, man, this sucks. And it's like, dude, five seconds ago, you didn't even have it, and you're already complaining about it? So it's like, yeah, you know? So it's, exactly. Um, so now people are getting used to the fact that they can get access to information now, and they can get access to it quick, and if they don't get it, something's wrong, you know? And so instead of like, okay, I'm going to wait for my show to come out, or, uh, you know, it's 6 o'clock, now it's time for my show, like, I can go like, well, I'll just DVR this, or I'll just download the torrent later and watch it whenever I feel like it, you know, or it's like two in the morning and I just, I feel like watching a movie. Why do I have to go to a theater and like get, I just watch it now, you know? Um, and so that's something that is a little bit jarring to a lot of companies too, because it's like, okay, how, <laughs> how can you manage that? You know, how can you communicate with your customers? How can you do all that stuff when it's all like, they're, they're pretty demanding, you know? So those are some, like, basically touch points for new media that I've found. Um, so I'm trying to, I'm going to quickly kind of put them together. So how does design thinking and the new media mesh together, right? Um, well, you start noticing some overlaps uh, between them because, again, people generally think of problem, solution, one way to do it. I found one way, it's good enough. Uh, but you can't do that anymore because things are way too complex um, and ambiguous and changing dynamically. Like, things are just happening so quickly nowadays that you can't just assume that it's a linear direction anymore. You have to be able to manage that complexity. You have to be able to um, embrace it in a way. And let it let kind of the environment take you to where it will versus trying to force your will onto the environment. Um, and so you notice, like, because new media has all these different aspects to it, you'll notice a lot of overlap with the design thinking approach would be, okay, it's dealing with all uncertainty. It's still maturing. How exactly is it going to pan out? We don't know the final destination of new media. Well, okay, we know that using design thinking in that process, we can kind of rely on that to give us good solutions. Uh, we know that new media is all about like, communication two ways. You know, design thinking is essentially communication. It's complex. Um, the fact that it's rapidly changing is a good thing to be doing when you're doing a lot of the conceptualization, conceptualization, revalidation, revalidation. So instead of like, I mean, when you think of a website and web content nowadays, it used to be like your product. I mean, even with interaction design and interfaces, um, before like you have a product with like a coffee machine, you put it on a table, it's done. I don't have to worry about it for like five years, ten years, you know, or these chairs for like 30 decades. Um, but now you have something like a website and if it's not refreshed in two years, it becomes really dated. Standards change, you know, flash is out the window and now you have to do HTML5. Oh, okay, I have to revamp everything. So it's never really finished anymore, you know? 
Um, and so that's why the iteration, iteration, revalidation, revalidation is an important part of the design process, an important part of new media is because you're constantly having to play catch up with new media, like what is happening now, what's evolving now. Um, so I'm just going to have a couple examples of what is considered new media, and which is um, one of these things. I can't have cheeseburger, all right? Um, it's an interesting example because um, lol cats and basically you know funny pictures of cats with captions on the internet. Uh, a couple of years back, I was, like me and my friends just like this is. It seems like everybody knew what a lol cat was, right? But then I would talk to my boss, who's just like a little bit older than me. He's like, what's that? Or I talk to my younger cousin, who's just a little bit younger than me, and he's like, what's that? And I'm like, wow, this is weird, because in my bubble, like, everybody knows what little cats are. But then just slightly outside of it, you know, nobody does. And so it's, A, interesting to notice that kind of fragmentation of it, but then B, at the same time, is this guy who made this stupid, he didn't actually make any content, right? Because of two-way communication, it's not just two-way communication. It's basically you're not having to rely on making content yourself. You're letting users make the content for you. And so instead of having to, you're less of, okay, I need to know how to make stuff. I have to know how to manage stuff that these users generate. And it's a different mindset. It's, well, it's like herding cats in a way. But this guy made up this cheesy little website in 2007, ended up selling for $2 million. Uh, and, and like, all he did was just came up with a silly idea, and it took off. And now it's actually like this entire media empire that has all these different types of fail blog, which is the same thing, except people like falling off ladders or like, you know, whatever, with a caption underneath it. Or it's one with dogs instead of cats. And like, there's this whole series based on this, and it gets tons of views. And then all of a sudden you get all these ads, and Again, you see things like the thumbs up and thumbs down. It's because of this two-way communication. People feel like they can add to it and they can get credit. And then, you know, you just have to kind of... And that's uh, something that you need to have a design approach where it's like, okay, well, I need to embrace the fact that I, I can't explicitly control everything that people make. Or I have to kind of let go and be a little bit of uncertainty, but I have to know how to manage it. I have to kind of predict that this is where somewhere the consumers might take it. And all of a sudden you have this media empire. Um, this is another one. It's called Pulse.me. It's actually starting out as an app. Um, and what it is is because there's so much... Well, essentially, it's like CNN, but completely personalized. And so you can pick all your news sources and what type of articles and from what field and what categories. Um, and you get a ton of information density here uh, and all the different articles. And so basically, you can pick these categories and make this completely customized broadcast like it's, it's, a di it's a digital newspaper printed exactly for your own wants and needs. Um, and the fact that these are seamlessly downloaded to the tablet, and so let's say you, know, you don't actually have internet, you can still read the articles. Um, so that's a good kind of indicator of, okay, well, what is the kind of future of media going to be? It's going to be completely customizable. It's going to be kind of instantaneous, it's going to be like this huge information overall, it's going to be this really customized thing. Okay, how are we dealing with that? And it's like, well, you're addressing a user's need, you know? This user now has this expectation about instantaneous contact, they have this expectation that it's going to be completely personalized, like, well, you're going to have to address those needs, otherwise they're going to move on to somebody else, as a lot of newspapers are finding out. This is another one, it's a good.is. Um, this is interesting because it's sort of, uh, instead of a blog in a sense, this is a, how a lot of blogs are kind of evolving these days. They just had a recent uh, update. And it's essentially just kind of, well, it's a blog, but it's about more environmental, social policy, that kind of things. Um, but what they've done is, if you notice at the top here, is like there's a for everyone, which is kind of like their general broadcast. There's for you, and then there's uh, explore. And so... They have taken this blog, which is sort of, if you still think about it, this kind of linear broadcast thing, and they've turned that into a way of where, okay, now it's like this two-way where I can customize the information that it's presenting to me. And so it's almost like the Internet is creating this thing where it's less of this content generation, and then there's this one way to get to that content, or it's broadcast out. 
it's turned into these nodules where this contact gets shoved to this guy, which is broadcast to this guy, which is linked back to this guy, and you get this huge kind of spider webs of um, information of having different ways of access to that information. And so you can basically pull all these different strands to yourself and uh, kind of get access to it that way versus say, this is the one place I need to get it. Um, and it's, it's like a very complex concept to kind of wrap your head around because, again, it's, it's this network theory. Anything with network just gets exponentially more difficult. But it's more like the Internet itself is there's not this single point. It's more like this meshed hub where, okay, if this site goes down, I can go to 20 others to get the content. What makes this one different? It's like, well, sort of because how they blend that content, how they've personalized it to me, the interface, um, the message it's producing, that sort of thing. Uh, that becomes important for connecting with the users instead of the content itself. And, of course, there's the uh, sort of infamous Reddit. Um, how many of you guys have heard of Reddit around here? Everybody. Fantastic. Um, and it, it used to not be that kind of known thing, but like people who knew Reddit knew Reddit, like they're on it all the time. And this is what makes it interesting uh, that is there's a lot of things that do the same thing. Like, for instance, there's something called Dig that was around a couple of years ago. It basically was exactly the same thing, but then it had a lot of competitors. Um, and then they did a redesign where they sort of got rid of this idea where the community itself generates. Well, not generates the content, but promotes the content. And they sort of said, oh, okay, well, we're going to do a little bit of editing. And then there is a huge conniption, and basically the company's dead now. Just because of one mistake they made where they no longer kind of, well, they didn't address the user's needs, or they misread it, and they said that, okay, well, we're going to kind of take power away from this community and kind of dictate ourselves what's going to get pushed out. They're, they they say we didn't like that uncertainty because let's say it's a lot of beneficials saying, okay, we can promote the specific content. That means the specific advertisers will like us, and then maybe we can make some more money. But then all of a sudden, the whole thing collapsed because they kind of the community revolted. And so, I mean, if you're not familiar with it as much, but basically, people find not even they're not even generating content. They're just finding content from other places in the web, and then based on again your subreddit or what you're managing. Um, it gets to the top, and that's all about this community of like basically street cred, which is really cool because again you you get this two-way communication, you get this integrated like fragmentation, but like this very very strong community, um, and it's kind of this is sort of like the newspaper of the future, really, if you think about it. So, of course, with new media there comes a bunch of new challenges. Um, these are just some that you know I, I kind of came up with. It's like piracy, which is a big one. That's a huge thing with RAA figuring out. Because if you can get content from all these different places and people don't really value so much the original content itself, but like having access to it more of, and you, or like what is ownership nowadays when everything's on the cloud, you know, or digital? So you know, it's be fascinating to ask a kid ten years from now what they think of physical things, like if that's even important anymore. Um, how many of you still buy CDs? Not that long ago, the CD was the thing to have, you know? And, and I mean, I was in a generation where this transition happened, where, like, I was eventually thinking, like, oh, I don't like the idea of not buying CD. Like, I, I want to own it, you know? It's like, but then the convenience factor just kind of overwhelmed it. Mm-hmm. What I have or how I use it. That's and I that's buy a CD, I rip it, yeah. And I can do whatever the hell I want. That's and this is a from my, from online, they've got control. Exactly. Um, and that's part of the whole like right to internet and manipulation thing. Like there was this thing where you this is really scary, but like at the same time really cutting edge is um, with the Kindle and there was this hubbub that happened with and it's you can't make this stuff up, but 1984, a bunch of people bought that book on their Kindle. And the publisher noticed there was like a typo or something wrong with it or something they didn't want. They're like, oh. So they pulled 
that book from all those people's Kindles. They didn't have access to this thing they have bought anymore. And, and it's like, but, yeah, exactly. It's like, nah, we can change it. And so, like, what is preventing them from changing a couple of paragraphs in there? Or, like, just saying, oh, you don't have access to this anymore. And this, this is, so, again, that ownership and, like, it's this trade-off between super convenience and instant access versus, again, rights and uh, basically senses of ownership or, like, again, back to the Google searches. It's like, it it's opens up this whole new kind of Pandora's box. Um, data mining, that's, uh, I have a friend who working at a startup, and it's like, not even the, the objective of the startup, but basically if you have this app on your phone, and they can, it pings once in a while, like your location, and they get all this database information, like tons of information, and basically just from that ping once in a while, it can essentially tell where you live and your route to work and where you're working, um, just by saying that, oh, well, they tend to be here on these certain days and certain hours, and then they tend to hear that. And this is stuff that people like aren't really cognizant, or cognizant of that's taking place, but it's happening. Well, yeah, who knows what they're up to. Um, so again, as it, this whole new media and new infrastructure that helps that is, it comes up with all these new challenges, but at the same time, it's, it's fascinating because what all the new potential you can do too. So again, it's this balancing act. Um, but if there's anything I want to take away from this is the fact that design's not just something for this elite, it is something that everybody can use based on like the approach of design thinking. And the design thinking is not necessarily just end product, but it's a process that helps you like address challenges and uncertainties. And you know, it's basically a powerful method to address the challenges of, for instance, new media. So um, hopefully you got a little bit of interesting little nuggets here and there. Um, uh, it was kind of entertaining, um, but I guess now, you know, we have some time. If you have any questions, you want to have whatever you feel like having, feel free to ask. If you have a question, I'm here. Yes. I have a question. So, you know, it, it, when we talk about, uh, my background's in photography, and when we talk about photography, we talk about the idea of, Originally, painting was all about synthesis, and photography let us go from synthesis to selection. We just chose the moment we wanted, and we captured it. We didn't have to paint it. We didn't have to go buy the right. paint on the okay. canvas, and we didn't synthesize anything. We just grabbed yeah, it. Captured. Now we're back to synthesis again. We're back to all of these pieces need to come together to create an interactive experience. And... Um, a photo is just one of those things, or, or a movie, or you know, it's all of those elements. And one of the things I'm always fascinated with is, is there a, an equivalent of the, you know, Werner Herzog calls it the, the ecstatic truth. When you just feel, feel something in a movie that is just so movie, so perfect to be seen in a movie. That thing on the, raises the hair on the back of your neck, that synchronization of maybe what you hear and what you, what you see. And in a photograph, we call it the decisive moment, that split second. Mm. Is there such a thing involving the synthesis of media that a designer needs to strive for when they create something in new media? Really interesting question. Um, first thing that came to my mind hearing it uh, is well, not so much that there's almost two different points that comes into play. It's that one point, like I was mentioning with the design process, when you kind of get that new idea and you notice that, hey, this could have some legs to it. I, I, you know, what if I take this one little concept and then integrate it with this concept and all of a sudden, wow, this is, this is new, this is fresh. Um, I'm, a lot of that I get is just from interaction, uh, which is more like the motion and behavior of, uh, like, say, digital spaces and it could be it's kind of like these things that delight people that it's unexpected but once they see it like imagine the first time you did a scroll on a touch device or the fact that you can actually use a touch device and then it had this little bit of inertia to it You're like oh wow that's cool I, like I instantly get it it gets that little bit of tingle like oh I know how to use this I didn't expect it it's, this is cool and so there's that idea that somebody said it, what if we have inertia in interaction?
that's like this nugget that's very good. And then there's actual implementation of it, where you do all the hard work and development to actually make it work good enough. Because, I mean, if you could do that and then it, it acts laggy and like it crashes your you know, iPad, uh, you're not going to get that cool experience. And so there's that two points where I think that comes into play, where it's the initial idea and then the actual successful implementation of that idea. Um, and to be fair, I was like, you know, you, that doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes it's just grunt work, you know, and it's like you, you have to just make it work good enough and there isn't that much delight. But that's kind of something that all designers strive for is that little bit of delight, you know, that little unexpected, like, hey, awesome, that makes people, you know, aspire to have your product, aspire to use it, that uh, enjoy using it, you know, instead of just like, you know, it, it's like using a Dell laptop which gets the job done and, you know, it doesn't excite you versus saying, like, you know, and it's not even this, it's not even, like, real functionality difference, but, like, you know, you get the sleek new MacBook Pro with the super retina display, you're like, ooh, you know, it's just that little bit of extra delight there, and that's a little bit of the magic that hopefully designers can interject in things, slash marketing teams. Oof. Uh, so, you know, you kind of get this chicken and the egg question with design that goes on slightly in technology. And yeah. so, you know, when we think of how quickly technology changes, do you think it's the design that's almost dictating the changes to technology? Or as technology shifts, do you have to change your design thinking to meet the new capabilities or new needs of the users? And that is also a good question. Um, and it's a little bit of both, to be honest. Um, you know, because you see that cyclical validation, you know, conceptualization. Um, but it's almost like a non-starter because the point is, again, if you think about it, addressing the user's needs, not using the technology, you know. Um, so it's almost like somebody will come to you with the new technology and then it will enable you to do new, new, like really cool new things that addresses somebody's needs and wants and desires. Um, or, you, I mean, it also depends on, like, what you're working to strive for so that, you know, how do I use a new technology or how do I use something or do something better with existing stuff? Um, but I almost don't see it as, like, a chicken and egg. It's almost like a chicken and egg that's happening on the side, but it's not the end goal. It's The end goal is, again, to address the user's needs. Like, you can, maybe you can even do something the same way with, like, I don't need... A, a MacBook anymore, I can just use a really nice pen on a piece of paper. You know, it's like, I, so I just sidestepped that whole issue. Fantastic. Yeah, I had a real quick question for you. I have an advertising background in graphic design too. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you um, said earlier about the, the post, um, problem solution. Pretty simple thing. It's a linear. Yeah. And now it's much more complex, but I, I, I never found it linear in my entire life. You had a lot of stuff out there. So talk a little bit more why you think it's more complex now that, than it, it I never found it linear. Yeah. Well, and, and I'm going back. Uh, oh, wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To be fair, I mean, it's, it's never been linear. Um, it's just that's a misconception that is either presented by, like, a lot of designers or, you know, it's just indirectly alluded to just because it's, you know, it makes a more compelling story. Like, you know, we figure it out. It, it's done. You know, we're, we're heroes. Versus like the guy pulling his hair out and is like, I don't think I'm going to make it this time, you know. Um, you know, all design has been doing that from the beginning. It's like figuring out the best way of approaching something. So, yeah, it's, it's again, it's never been, it's never actually been linear. Although, to be fair, it has, I'd say, gotten a little bit more complicated because um, our perspective and our worldview has gotten bigger. Um, and just by the nature of globalization, the fact that we have the internet. So it used to be like, you know, you know your community, and now you can, I know what the nation's doing, and now I can know what the entire world's doing. In the sense, like, I have access to information and, like, current events instantly, that it just, so it's almost like people's expectations or exposure to things are just, it's just bigger. Um, I mean, the, the thing that I can think of immediately to be with, uh, would be like for design, like because again, my sustainability background. Um, you know, it used to be that we don't really care what it's made out of. The whole point is like, okay, does it, you know, meet the specifications that okay, this is good enough, it'll be durable enough. 
um, you know, it'll be cheap enough to make. But now we're starting to push it like, okay, well, what's the impact on the people and the environment by using this material, transporting this material, of, you know, disposing of this material, and all of a sudden that, it's like, oh, these are things I haven't thought of before. And then that starts becoming the expectation that you thought of, you know, uh, because that just, just needs to be addressed because we're aware of it. You know, it's like, you can't just say, oh, this is extra stuff that now I know exists, but I'm just going to ignore it, because I mean, then that makes you basically irresponsible. So, same thing with now that people are expecting this really cool interaction with, like, scrolling and, like, you know, physics behind the you know, scroll wheels and things like that, when you don't give that to them or you don't consider it, then they're like, oh, this is not meeting my expectations. And so... It's just, again, because of the nature of the Internet and information overload, people just get exposed to more stuff, and so you kind of have to at least address it or be cognizant of it, if that makes sense. Same thing with, like, social issues and stuff. I mean, like, you know, now you have to be... It's like it kind of maybe evolved from political correctness into more like, well, I have to be aware of that saying this thing is going to be offensive to somebody. I mean, and do you have a plan of addressing that, you know? Or the fact that now you have exposure to such a wider audience, the fact that you now have the statistically bigger chance of actually offending somebody who now can broadcast the fact that they're offended to, like, the same audience. And so it's, um, you can't, yeah, you can't ignore the, the problems anymore. Does that... Here's one that's probably a little bit more personal. Um... Tell me um, one of your design failures and what did you learn from it? Mm. Uh, um, personal design failures. I don't have those. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, well, this is what's kind of nice to begin working in a collaborative environment, is, um, especially with you know, more experienced designers, um, and which makes it fun to take on projects where you kind of push um, I mean, there have been many instances, well, actually there's, I'll, I'll start with personally, there have been many instances when I'll come with conceptualization, you know, and, you know, again, it's like just pulling your hair, you don't see where it's going, and you try to figure, and so I'll come up with concepts or like, you know, aesthetic styles and stuff that I'll present in, for an internal review, right? And then, you know, the boss man will come and like, you know, shoot him down. It's like, what are you thinking? You're completely off base or like, you know, you haven't thought about this, or you're not addressing this problem, or, you know, this definitely isn't going to work because of this, this, this reasons. And you're like, you know, of course, I should have thought of that. Why didn't I? And so um, I have the benefit of, again, having, again, the, the, the collaboration makes it less likely that that failure will kind of come out to the client and, like, eventually get implemented. But at the same time, there are many instances when we've, done something that we misread a client or we didn't address uh, enough of a spectrum or range of concepts and then we present it to them and then they're like, I don't like any of these. And you're like, oh. Um, you know, there's some people who will say that, well, they don't know what they're talking about. You know, they're a client. They're, of course they don't know anything. They have bad taste in design, um, which can kind of be true because, yeah, technically you are the expert, but at the same time, you're an expert and you're supposed to be expertise enough to be able to guide them and read them enough to be able to give something that they'll like. And so there have been instances where we have to go back from scratch and like redo an entire project because they just weren't ever satisfied. Um, that being said, there's lots of times where they had, you know, other objectives on the side that they wouldn't tell us and so they're like, oh well, you know, we want these guys to fail because we're a consultant, and so they can, we can put the blame on them, and then we'll be the heroes because then we come up with our idea that we want to produce. So that's a whole other aspect when you're working with consultancies. That's like, I mean, I had no idea exposure to school, but like, um, that's like 50% of every project is reading the client, figuring them out, like seeing how to tactically approach them. Um, that's a whole other thing. I mean, aside from the complexities of the design itself, so. A lot of failures end up with not reading the client personally. Okay. 
Uh, thanks so much, everybody. Thank you for allowing me to speak. All right, one more round of applause for him. One more round of applause. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys for joining us this week. Again, all of the content from this lecture, previous lectures, future lectures can be found on newmediavisionaries.org. Next week, if you guys would like to come, we invite you to come to the engineering building in room 189 where Bruce Carlisle, who is a digital advertising pioneer, will be our next lecturer. And uh, again, thanks for coming.